Ian Blackford. Mr Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I wish the Prime Minister well? I hope she recovers her voice in a speedy yeah, manner. Yeah. Mr Speaker, Winifred Ewing, when she stood for election to the Highlands and Islands for the European election, said the following. This vast area, the largest seat in Europe, really must have a Scottish voice to speak up for it, with no priorities like the London parties and no diktats from London, just simply to speak up for the vast area and all the industries of which are under threat. Mr Speaker, Madam McCoss, our trailblazer for Scotland's voice being heard in Europe, strengthened our cultural ties and our community's opportunities by fighting for a strong voice for Scotland in the European Union. Yeah, yeah. Winnie Ewing used her voice in Europe to attract funding to the Highlands and Islands, funding that benefited local transport hubs and infrastructure. Winnie also chaired the European Parliament's Education and Cultural Committee when Erasmus was established in the late 1980s. That is why, Mr Speaker, in Scotland we cherish the opportunities the Erasmus programme brings to our students and to our country. To stand here today with only 17 days to go until we exit the EU, to know that Scotland's historic place in Europe is under threat is devastating. United in diversity. That is the motto of the European Union that first came into use in 2000. This motto signifies how independent states came together in common endeavour to work for peace and for prosperity. The beauty of the European project is that it has allowed us all to work together whilst being enriched by the continent's many different cultures, traditions and languages at the same time. We have been enriched by that cultural diversity whilst the single market has granted economic opportunity for our citizens. We have all gained, not lost. In Europe, we learn from each other. Just last month, the Irish Senate debated following in Scotland's footsteps and introducing the baby box, a progressive policy that is benefiting the lives of citizens in Scotland. Mr Speaker, that is what the European Union has always been about, partnership to improve the lives of our nations, advancing the opportunities for our citizens and our communities. Standing together, we have worked to protect our values of human dignity, of freedom, of democracy, of equality, of the rule of law and of human rights. Our shared endeavour to building a society in which inclusion, inclusion, tolerance, justice, solidarity and non-discrimination prevail. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. I'm very sorry indeed to interrupt what was wonderfully poetic posed by the Honourable Gentleman. But could I just ask him to look at the wider country of the United Kingdom and explain to this House, before we vote tonight, the consequences, please, of leaving the EU without a deal, a Brexit a Brexit without a deal and the consequences, particularly for Northern Ireland. The Leader of the Opposition couldn't take an intervention from me. We need to spell out to the people of Northern Ireland the consequences. The people of Northern Ireland, by the way, many of them, many of them, the majority of them are not represented by the DUP, who have ten seats in this House, duly elected, but the DUP do not speak for the majority of people in Northern Ireland. Many businesses Many farmers, many fishermen, many people, many commu community leaders support the Prime Minister's Brexit deal. What does the Honourable Gentleman think of the consequences for Northern Ireland, not just for Scotland? I respect his views in Scotland, but I need him to spell out the thinking of the SNP about the consequences for Northern Ireland remaining within the United Kingdom, which I wanted to do, and I do not want violence back on the border again from dissident Republicans. <laughs> Well, I, I thank the Honourable Member for her intervention. I must say that the UK is not a country. The UK is a state. Some would say it's some state. Scotland is a, is a country, and we wish to have our rights as EU citizens protected. But, Mr Speaker, I hope that this House overwhelmingly rejects the Prime Minister's deal tonight. But tomorrow, tomorrow we must take our responsibilities. 
Tomorrow we must take our responsibilities and vote down no deal, which is catastrophic. The Prime Minister could have done that some months ago, and it's regrettable that we've had to wait till just over two weeks before we're supposed to leave before we can we can do so. I, no, I must make I must make some progress. Mr. Speaker, together we gather once again, listening to the voices across this chamber argue that we must leave our European destiny behind. I cannot countenance why we would leave those shared values and common endeavour behind. Our conflict and war, our countries have come to, out of conflict and war, our countries have come together. Our communities have thrived in times of peace, collaboration and cooperation with our neighbours, delivering a new world of opportunity for all our citizens. Mr Speaker, despite the theatre of this place, when we poke and jar at each other in truth, today is painful, and I am deeply sad that we have reached this point of complete crisis. In homes across the United Kingdom, families, our families, our friends, our communities are watching. In Amsterdam, in Brussels, in Berlin, in Madrid, in Dublin, in Paris, I could go on. Our friends and neighbours are watching. And what must they be thinking? The historic achievement of the European project unravelling. And for what? To replace partnership and stability with isolation and chaos. Because let's not beat around the bush. This battle began in the Tory party and there it should have stayed. The Euroscepticism that consumed members of the Tories for decades festered and consumed their party until David Cameron rolled the dice. And where is he now? After he opened the box and spilled the Tory war onto the streets across the country, he abdicated all responsibility. The historical internal Conservative divisions have now divided the United Kingdom. But today, members must decide if they will too also abdicate responsibility and roll the dice, or act in the interest of their constituents, and act to stop the greatest act of self-harm to our economy. Mr Speaker, we on these benches know our responsibilities, and we will not follow those that started the fire into the flames. I give way. Well, he shouldn't be like that. I haven't even said anything yet. <laughs> Can I just ask him to go back slightly and reflect, like I have, on the fact that it is five years this year, in fact, from last month, in which 100 people were gunned down by the government of Ukraine, the then Yanukovych government of Ukraine, because they wished to join the European Union. So when he reflects on what people must think across the continent, I can tell him that they are aghast at the way that the Speaker who came before him talked down the European Union, when the truth is that it is an aspiration for many to join it because of the very advantages he outlines in terms of economic prosperity and peace. My honourable friend is quite correct, and I have to say I have some difficulty in reconciling ourselves with what we are doing. Mr Speaker, I had the opportunity to work in the continent of Europe. My son had the opportunity to work in the continent of Europe. We are taking that automatic right away from my grandchildren. If the Prime Minister gets her way in just over a couple of weeks, that right that we all have to live and work and get an education in 28 EU states is being reduced to only one. Why? Why, Mr Speaker, are we doing that? We are simply doing it because of the Eurosceptics and the Tory party that have driven us to that position. What a disgrace that those opportunities that many people have benefited from are being taken away. And you know, whilst I'm saying this, they may not see it on the camera, but the Prime Minister is sitting there laughing. The Prime Minister laughing. Well, these opportunities are being stolen because that's what they are for our future generations. It is an absolute disgrace that the Prime Minister would behave in the way that she's doing. And I'll give her the opportunity to stand up and perhaps argue why it's right that our young people should be denied that opportunity. Why we should act in a way, act in a way which is taking away these opportunities. Oh, oh, I invite the right honourable gentleman to resume his seat. The Prime Minister is perfectly capable of defending herself, but I, I must say there's not been re anything remotely unseemly or untoward, s still less unparliamentary about the Prime Minister's behaviour today or indeed any other day. She's sitting 
listening with a smile on her face. It seems a very reasonable thing to do. The Right Honourable Gentleman is an old hand, and he's, he's whipping it up, and I don't knock him. The order, I don't knock him, but I say to others, calm, no excessive gesticulation. A man as cerebral as you, Mr Quarteng, does not need to point in an aggressive manner. You're a cerebral denizen of the House. Remember that. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. These are serious matters. And they deserve to be taken seriously. And the fact, I'm not arguing for one moment that the Prime Minister is behaving in a way which is unparliamentary. I wouldn't seek to do so. But I do say that it is undignified to see the Prime Minister laughing when I'm talking about the rights that will be taken away from our young people. That, Mr. Speaker, is unforgivable. No. Mr. Speaker, after a last late night in Strasbourg and some careful packaging today, the Prime Minister thinks she can fool us the way she has fooled those on her own benches. Mr Speaker, we won't be fooled. Nothing has changed. The Attorney General's legal advice is crystal clear. The Prime Minister has failed to secure a time limit or unilateral exit mechanism from the backstop. The changes secured by the Prime Minister apply in the highly unlikely situation where the EU has acted in bad faith. This confirms that the Prime Minister's strategy has been recklessly running down the clock, attempting to blackmail Parliament to choose either the Prime Minister's non-starter deal or a no deal. Mr Speaker, this deal isn't a new deal. It's the same deal and it's the same bad deal for Scotland. The events of the last 24 hours change nothing for Scotland. This is the same deal, the same Prime Minister, the same Tory party treating Scotland with contempt. It is the same disastrous deal that ignores the people of Scotland's overwhelming vote for Remain and will cost jobs and hit living standards. Does the Prime Minister have no respect for the Scottish Government, for the Scottish Parliament, for the people of Scotland? Mr Speaker, the fact is today for the Prime Minister this is about her future and her party's future, nothing more. This UK government doesn't care about Scotland's future as they press forward this Brexit bombshell, inflicting unprecedented socio-economic and political harm. The supposed concessions are merely a fig leaf for a problem that the UK has created for itself. This fig leaf can't disguise the fact that it was a bad deal in December a bad deal in January, and it's still a bad deal today. This chaotic attempt to placate the extreme Tory Brexiteers only serves to prolong the chaos and uncertainty. I'll give way. I am grateful to the right honourable gentleman for giving me way, Mr Speaker. Why does he choose to ignore the votes of one million Scots who voted to leave? Why does he choose to ignore the voices of NFUS the National Farmers Union of Scotland? Why does he choose to ignore the voices of the Scottish Chamber of Commerce or the Scotch Whisky Association or Diageo or any other number of business trade groups who are saying to all Scottish members of Parliament that they should be supporting the Prime Minister's deal to deliver an orderly Brexit? Well, I knew, I knew if I gave well, uh, way to the honourable gentleman, he would embarrass himself, and that's exactly what he's done. Because the reality, the reality, Mr. Speaker, is that Scotland voted by 62% to 38% to remain. And what should be happening is that Scottish, so-called Scottish Conservative members of Parliament should be standing up for their constituents in Scotland that have no desire. Dear Mr. Kerr. I thought that you would have satisfied yourself with your contribution of considerable eloquence and passion on your feet. You mustn't now holler from your seat. I advise you to imitate the parliamentary Buddha, the father of the house, right on the middle of the gentleman member Rushcliffe, who is repose personified, Mr Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We're used to Scottish Conservatives shouting from the sidelines. Mr Speaker, this is a blindfold Brexit which will take Scotland out of the single market, which is eight times the size of the UK, and will leave people at the mercy of the Tories as they continue to tear themselves apart. Mr Speaker, this is a rotten deal 
that will lead to the impoverishment of our country, led by the Tory party. Indeed, my honourable friend is quite correct, and we can all remember in our referendum in Scotland pre-2014 that we were promised a bonanza of orders that would come to the shipyards on the Clyde, and we know exactly what happened to that. Mr Speaker, let me come back to the Chancellor. Here it is, ready to trot in behind the Prime Minister to deliver a blindfold Brexit that will send our economy into an unmitigated disaster, a shameful act of cowardice from the Chancellor, putting his party before people. Instead of coming clean with this Parliament, with the public, the Prime Minister asks us to vote blindly for this deal today. Despite numerous attempts to ascertain if this government has even conducted an economic analysis of the Prime Minister's deal, they have still not published any analysis. Mr Speaker, what is the Prime Minister hiding? It is the height of irresponsibility for the Prime Minister to bring her deal to Parliament without providing the analysis of its impact. We know her deal will cost jobs. It is ludicrous for MPs to be asked to vote on a deal which completely blind to the economic consequences. Will the Prime Minister not end the shroud of secrecy and come clean with the MPs and the whole of the United Kingdom? Mr Speaker, analysis published on the LSE website estimate the Brexit deal could reduce UK GDP per capita by between 1.9 and 5.5 per cent in 10 years' time compared to remaining in the EU. The National Institute of Economic and Social Research have warned that if the Government's proposed Brexit deal is implemented, then GDP in the longer term will be around 4 per cent lower than it would have been if the UK had stayed in the EU. That's the reality. Will members on opposite benches vote for a deal without knowing the consequences? Will they sleepwalk into disaster? Mr Speaker, I appeal to members, don't do this. The consequences are too grave. What is coming down the line after today is unknown, and what is known is that it all points to chaos. Even in the political declaration, the UK Government confirms its intention to end free movement of people, which is vital to meet Scotland's needs for workers in sectors such as health and social care. Mr Speaker, I met with a young trainee vet on the Isle of Skye a week past Saturday in Portree, a young woman from Spain that wants to remain in Scotland. But when she qualifies as a vet, she will not meet the earnings threshold that would guarantee her the right to live in Scotland. Prime Minister, that's what leaving the EU is doing, denying opportunities to young people that want to make a contribution to our economy. And it's shameful to see the Honourable Member for Stirling shaking his head, because that's the opportunities that we have that we will lose to benefit the economy and, more widely, the social benefits that we get from that in Scotland, I will give way. Just very briefly, I mean, we, we often talk, we often talk in particular, and rightly so, about the impact of the salary threshold. But will he acknowledge there is a significant community of people, indeed across the UK, who have retired to this country from across the European Union? As my constituent from Italy said to me at the weekend, if the place gets too expensive, she'll just go back to the beach. Absolutely right. And I would simply say to the government that they need to reflect on this. They are a, an estimated 235,000 EU citizens living in Scotland, alongside an estimated 142,000 other international migrants. Together, they represent 7% of our population. And, Mr. Speaker, they are welcome. Yeah. Scottish government analysis suggests that by 2040, Scotland's population would decrease by 10,800 people without migration. Mr. Speaker. This deal will cause untold damage, not just for the current generation, but for the next. This deal will still make our people poorer, our businesses weaker, our economy smaller. We cannot let this happen. What is democracy if citizens cannot be allowed to change their minds? Members can sneer and jeer from the sidelines as they have, but beneath their outward aggression, I am sure there is their conscience. And if members look at that, they will know. No one can act in good conscience against the facts. Members across this House know that Brexit is bad for Britain. It's bad for families, it's bad for business, bad for the economy, bad for cooperation, and bad for trade and for growth. And I am in no doubt 
that those Scottish Tories are well aware of the consequences. They have been well outlined by academics, economists and many others. Brexit is bad for Scotland. Mr Speaker, last week I visited Edinburgh University. 26% of the academic community at Edinburgh University are from the EU. And the Vice Principal told me that mobility is the key, and that academic community are already expressing concern. They have still been able to recruit, but the pool of candidates is becoming shallower because, quite simply, people don't want to come to Brexit Britain. That's the reality, Prime Minister, and it's this government that is responsible for that. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is playing a game of smoke and mirrors to save her own skin, not the future interests of the people across the United <coughs> Kingdom. The Prime Minister has renegotiated nothing. The Prime Minister promised legal changes to the withdrawal agreement. Nothing even close has been achieved. Let me remind the House the Prime Minister was unequivocal on the 29th of January. What I am talking about is not a future exchange of letters, but a significant and legally binding change to the withdrawal agreement. Negotiating such a change will not be easy. It will involve reopening the withdrawal agreement, a move which I know there is limited appetite amongst our European partners. But, Mr Speaker, the EU27 refused to reopen the withdrawal agreement. The fact remains that the EU27 have not reached any agreement with the UK in negotiations on changes to the backstop or the withdrawal agreement. The window dressing on the backstop is simply to allow the ERG to slide their support behind the Prime Minister and save the blushes of the extreme Brexiteers. But we now know from what has been in the media that even that has not worked. Mr Speaker, Fintan O'Toole, the Irish Times journalist, noted last night the ridiculousness of the government's actions. He tweeted, very hard to see what is really new in all of this. It is the withdrawal agreement served with a side order of this does not mean what it does not mean anyway. <laughs> Joe Maughan QC also commented in reference to the Prime Minister not only did she fail to get any changes to the withdrawal agreement, but she was also made publicly to agree there are no changes to the withdrawal agreement. <coughs> and a key player in the negotiations, the Irish Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, has noted the extra layers are complementary to the deal and not a rewrite. Here. Nothing has been changed except the fact that the DUP have been bought a new comfort blanket. Well, Mr Speaker, we on these benches, unlike the DUP, cannot be bought. The Prime Minister is so desperate, it is clear she will go to any lengths to undermine the will of the House that has already voted against this deal. Last week we saw the Conservative Government offer bribe after bribe to Labour MPs. On Monday, the 4th of March, the Government announced a £1.6 billion Brexit City Fund. The Government has still not confirmed if any of this will come to Scotland, and I do not hear Scottish Conservative MPs standing up for Scotland when it comes to that. On Wednesday, the 6th of March, the Government announced plans to give MPs the right to decide whether to enforce future EU changes on workplace rights and standards after the UK has left the EU. But Francis O'Grady of the TUC dismissed this. They come nowhere close to ensuring existing rights are protected. And they won't stop workers' rights in the UK from falling behind those in the rest of Europe. Mr Speaker, since January we have seen the UK Government buying fridges in bulk to stockpile drugs, practice traffic jams in airfields and awarding ferry contracts to companies with no ferries. But Mr Speaker, let me remind the House the Prime Minister lost the first meaningful votes by 432 to 202. This is the same deal. Nothing has changed. But, Mr Speaker, this is not a binary choice before us. This is not a deal or no deal. There is still a way to protect our citizens. And I appeal to members, in particular to Scottish MPs, to stand with the SNP, reject the government's negotiated withdrawal agreement for the future relationship with the UK, recognise the resolutions of the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly of 5 March to oppose the UK government's exit deal. Say that a no deal outcome to the current negotiations on EU withdrawal would be completely unacceptable on the 29th of March or at any other time. Acknowledge the endorsement of this House of the claim of right for Scotland on the 4th of July 2018, recognising the sovereign right of the Scottish people to determine the form of government best suited to our needs. Recognise that Scotland should not be forced to leave the EU against its will.
ensure that this place, that this Prime Minister and this shoddy Tory government understand that the best future for Scotland lies in becoming, like so many of our neighbours, a full, equal, sovereign, independent member state of the European Union. The Prime Minister has no mandate from Scotland for her deal. On the 15th of January, 83% of Scottish MPs voted against the Prime Minister's deal. On Tuesday, the 12th of March, the Scottish Parliament and Welsh Assembly voted on a historic joint motion rejecting the Prime Minister's deal and rejecting no deal. And, Mr Speaker, I will remind the House and those Scottish Tories sitting nestling in the, Sc in the government benches. In June 2016, 62% of the Scottish voters voted to remain. Every local authority voted to remain. Scotland's decision must be respected. I appeal to members, stand up for the interests of your constituents. To Scottish MPs, to do the right thing and stand up and fight for Scotland. Scotland did not vote for leave and we will not be dragged out of the European Union against our will. We will not remain strapped to the sinking ship. The First Minister has sought compromise at every opportunity. We in the SNP, in Government in Edinburgh and here in the Commons, have sought every opportunity to compromise, but we have been dismissed by this Tory Government. Scotland has been treated with contempt, ignored, sidelined and often silenced. The Tories think they can do whatever they want to Scotland, but we will have the chance to vote on independence, to make Scotland a destination in Europe. Our First Minister has been clear. So I say to members, stand with us. I say to the Prime Minister, give it up. Extend Article 50 and bring forward a second EU referendum. Her government has utterly failed to negotiate a deal fit for the country. And I say to the, <coughs> the Leader of the Opposition, you almost got off the fence. Isn't it time you got off it properly? We have reached this critical point and still the Labour Party is unwilling to act rather than blow hot smoke. May I remind the Leader of the Opposition that there is still a live motion of no confidence in this Government that has yet not been signed by the Labour front bench. <coughs> we have the opportunity to end this madness and go back to the people. It is long past the time for that the Leader of the Opposition has some courage. What is he waiting for or what is he running scared of? Um, Mr. Sp I want to appreciate my friends giving way. This House needs to find a way of compromising to get out of the fix that we're in. A difficult question I understand, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I appreciate the SNP do not like the Prime Minister's deal, and many of us for very re various reasons don't either. If we were to make it subject to a people's vote, I suspect that would get this Parliament, this House and this Prime Minister out of a hole. Yep. Would the SNP consider it as a way out of this impasse for the benefit of our country? I thank the Honourable Lady for that question. And let me say um, enthusiastically that the Scottish National Party supports a people's vote on the basis of the facts that we now know. That we know that there is no such thing as a good Brexit. As we know that it is going to cost jobs, the right thing to do is to present the facts to the people of the United Kingdom. And I implore the House to get behind the people's vote. Mr Speaker, we have an opportunity here tonight to do what is the right thing. The people we represent have given us their trust to do what is right for them, for their families and for their communities. Vote Leave was a farce. It pumped lies into the campaign. It sold the public a pup. People must have the right to change their minds, and we must have the courage as political leaders to give people the right to change their minds. While the world looks on and wonder at what on earth the UK is about to do, I ask that every member recalls how much we stand to lose. And let me finally say, Mr Speaker, we on those ben these benches will not allow our nation to be dragged out of Europe into the abyss. Scotland has a bright future, and that future is as an independent European nation. In fact, it was the member for Halton, Price and Howden, the ex-Brexit secretary, who at the weekend noted there is no treaty in the world where a sovereign nation can only leave when the other side says so. So that's the key point, the ability to get out when we need to. Mr Speaker, the people of Scotland are sovereign under the terms of our constitutional framework, and they too should have the ability to get out of this mess, and by goodness we need to. So I ask the members to support the SNP that when we decide to call for an action to have a referendum in Scotland at this House, should respect that we will not go down with a sinking ship. As Winnie Ewing famously said, stop the world, 
Scotland wants to get on. And I say to the people of Scotland, if we can't save the United Kingdom from itself, now is time to save Scotland. An independent Scotland at the heart of 